The Eureka Rebellion The History and Legacy of the Gold Miners' Uprising Against the British in Australia Written by Charles River Editors Narrated by Gregory T. Lusitano Introduction A company of troopers and military carried the war into the enemy's camp. In a very short time, numbers were shot and hundreds taken prisoner. The sight in the morning was truly appalling, men lying dead slain by evil. The remedy is very lamentable, but it appears it was necessary. It is hoped now rebellion will be checked. Rev. Theophilus Taylor A land of almost three million square miles has lain since time immemorial on the southern flank of the planet, so isolated that it remained entirely outside of European knowledge until 1770. However, the first human footprints on this vast territory were felt 70,000 years earlier, as people began to cross the periodic land bridges and the short sea crossings from Southeast Asia. The history of the indigenous inhabitants of Australia, known in contemporary anthropology as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia, is a complex and continually evolving field of study, and it has been colored by politics. For generations after the arrival of whites in Australia, the Aboriginal people were disregarded and marginalized, largely because they offered little in the way of a labor resource, and they occupied land required for European settlement. At the same time, it is a misconception that indigenous Australians meekly accepted the invasion of their country by the British, for they did not. They certainly resisted. But as far as colonial wars during that era went, the frontier conflicts of Australia did not warrant a great deal of attention. Indigenous Australians were hardly a warlike people, and without central organization or political cohesion beyond scattered family groups, they succumbed to the orchestrated advance of white settlement with passionate but futile resistance. In many instances, aggressive clashes between the two groups simply gave the white colonists reasonable cause to inflict a style of genocide on the aborigines that stood in the way of progress. Although Australia was actually colonized by the forced dispossession of the indigenous aboriginals, the Commonwealth of Australia came about by the free federation of six self-governing British colonies in 1901, which makes it one of just a handful of nations that can proudly claim this. Thus, Australia is often imagined as a nation untouched by the pains that have accompanied the births of most other nations. While it is certainly true that the founding fathers of the Australian Federation discussed the future of their nation without the fear of war, it is equally true that Australia's history was shaped by violence. Along with the forced dispossession of indigenous populations across the continent, there were occasional uprisings among the transported convict population in early colonial times notably the Castle Hill Convict Rebellion of 1804. In that conflict, 233 Irish convicts faced 97 British soldiers, resulting in the deaths of 15 prisoners. Then there was the so-called Rum Rebellion in 1808, when the New South Wales Corps, led by Major George Johnston and the pastoralist John MacArthur, deposed the governor of New South Wales, William Bly. This event was notable in being the only successful seizure of political power by force of arms in the history of colonial Australia. To the list of politically violent deeds, many historians and commentators add the acts of some bushrangers, notably Ned Kelly, 1854-1880, who was often regarded as a political revolutionary. In the relatively short history of colonial Australia, one event stands apart, both for its revolutionary spirit and its impact the Eureka Rebellion of December 3, 1854. This was the only time in Australian history when a government was resisted by free subjects of the Crown in a violent conflict. It only took place in one colony, Victoria, but it was an important event in the evolution of the democratic government in Australia as a whole. The Eureka Rebellion the history and legacy of the gold miners' uprising against the British in Australia analyzes the chain of events that led to the fighting and its lasting impact. Along with pictures of important people, places, and events, you will learn about the Eureka Rebellion like never before. The British Colonization of Australia In the late 18th century, 
The broad pattern of British trade saw British ships embarking south from England, sailing with the currents across the Atlantic before striking east via the Cape of Good Hope to India. They would then load up on opium grown under duress by the Indians and ship it to China, where it was sold under duress to the Chinese. For the return journey, tea and various other exotic produce from India were acquired. Vital to this trade equation was the Cape of Good Hope, a Dutch possession since 1652 and a pivotal strategic maritime position. As far as the British were concerned, the Cape of Good Hope was, at least for the time being, the weak link in the chain. The Dutch were allied with the French, and in addition to the Cape of Good Hope, the Dutch also held the important Salinese port of Trincomalee, from which they and their French allies were in a position to threaten British India and British trade interests throughout the region. If push came to shove and the Cape of Good Hope became unavailable, the British trading fleet would be forced to utilize the east coast of South America, dealing with numerous Spanish and Spanish allied regimes inimical to the British. After which the Cape Horn or Magellan Straits would require negotiation before the long haul across the South Pacific to India. This would certainly not have been ideal. Then there was the more subtle question of basic raw materials. The Royal Navy, the largest single maritime force in existence, had stripped the British Isles of timber reserves to the extent that a fleet of wooden ships could not be domestically sustained. British timber supplies that supported the local shipbuilding industries not only came mainly from Russia, but also other Baltic nations. However, in the aftermath of the American Revolution, Russia had become rather estranged and could no longer entirely be trusted. An average Royal Navy or merchant ship of the line utilized more than one mast, which was often several hundred feet tall, and these frequently required repair and replacement. So did the sails and the ships themselves. Denmark and Sweden, alternative sources of timber for the British, were also now of uncertain status, having signed on with the Russian-sponsored pro-American League of Armed Neutrality. It certainly was a hostile world for the British in the late 18th century, even as the British stood to benefit most from international trade. The Royal Navy and the British maritime fleet dominated the major maritime trade routes, but they did so from a position with almost no friends. And ultimately, if Britain could not rely on the cooperation of any other European powers, then the alternative was simply to make do alone. Cook happened to be of the opinion that the only major sources of timber and flax in the Pacific region were to be found in New Zealand and Norfolk Island, located some 1,000 miles northeast of Botany Bay. Nonetheless, it was his opinion that Botany Bay represented the most viable location for a permanent British colony. In 1785, the French mounted a scientific expedition to the South Pacific, with the ostensible purpose of mapping and exploration. On board were some 60 French convicts, intent, according to British espionage sources, on establishing a naval base on the shores of New Holland. When news of this reached the imperial establishment in Britain, it was gripped by the sudden urgency to establish a British colony before the French could get there and do the same. Leading the effort to take practical possession of New Holland was eminent British gentleman scientist and naturalist Joseph Banks, president of the Royal Geographic Society and a major figure in British exploration. Banks had accompanied Captain James Cook on his preliminary voyage to New Holland, and he was generally regarded in British circles as the leading authority on Australia. Having earlier declared the territory unfit for British colonization, he now championed colonization with a furious passion. Supported by the Society and by the extremely influential board of the British East India Company, the British establishment responded quickly. Thus, on May 13, 1787, the first fleet set sail. The fleet of eleven ships was commanded by Captain Arthur Philip, and a race with the French was on. It was not known precisely where the French fleet was, but it was understood, or perhaps hoped, that the hastily assembled British expedition had the jump. To be safe. Three of the faster ships in the fleet quickly broke away, arriving in Botany Bay on January 18th, 1788. Philip, a man of enormous competence and extremely decided opinions, felt after a few days that Botany Bay did not meet the needs of a settlement, so he moved the entire fleet a few miles north up the coast to Port Jackson. The expedition dropped anchor in a sheltered harbor, and the site was named Sydney Cove, now more or less the site of the Royal Botanical Gardens.
The settlement that grew up around Port Jackson took on the name Sydney, in honor of the British Home Secretary, Lord Sydney. Meanwhile, the French fleet arrived in Botany Bay, narrowly behind the British, and as they did, Philip dispatched a small force to Norfolk Island, in order to claim that before the French could gather their senses. The French lingered for a while, but the deed was done, and New Holland, demarcated by common understanding as the eastern coast of Terra Australis, was effectively British. At least initially, this did not change much. The British had made preliminary landfall on the Australian coast and established a nascent colony, but that hardly opened the door to immediate dominance of the South Pacific. Nonetheless, it was a major moment in the imperial machinations of the age, as history would later prove. Technically, the British were now in a position to potentially project power across the South Pacific to Spanish America, but perhaps most importantly, the British could now challenge the Spanish claim to the northwest coast of the American continent. It also positioned the British to challenge French and Dutch holdings in the Far East, and to better protect British interests in India, which by then was emerging as the virtual treasury of the British Empire. The British cover story for all of this was the establishment of an overseas penal colony, which fooled no one. This story, apart from the fact that it would in due course become a self-fulfilling prophecy, was aimed as much at opposition within the United Kingdom as to the French or the Dutch. There was a great deal of domestic opposition to the establishment of a British colony in such a remote location, and one so disconnected from Europe at that. Captain Philip was installed as the first governor of the colony the colony of New South Wales, which was formally established on January 26, 1788. Soon afterwards, Philip wrote to his sponsor, Lord Shelburne, the ex-Prime Minister, that it will be four years at least before this colony will be able to support itself. Still, my lord, I think that perseverance will answer every purpose proposed by government, and that this country will hereafter be a most valuable acquisition to Great Britain from its situation. In both cases, Governor Philip would prove right. The British territorial claim on the east coast of New Holland comprised everything eastward of 135 degrees east, and all the islands of the Pacific Ocean between Cape York and the southern tip of Tasmania, then known as Van Diemen's Land. This included Norfolk Island and New Zealand. There was deep circumspection in the metropolitan capital as the new colony began to form. The British psyche was still wounded somewhat by events in America, and there was a sense that starting a colony at such a huge distance from Europe upon an utterly vacant continent would simply encourage the creation of another America. Many figured the vast imperial investment necessary to propagate the colony to a state of self-sufficiency would ultimately be wasted when that colony declared itself independent. There was an excellent reason to suppose that this would indeed happen, the American Revolution had been widely supported, and it galvanized other colonized populations across the civilized world to dream of their own emancipation. As far as the British were concerned, neither India nor any of His Majesty's various scattered dominions posed any kind of revolutionary threat quite yet, but Scotland and Wales did, and without a doubt the Irish were always ready to throw off the British. If revolutionary sentiments spread, the British Empire could find itself in trouble, and Britain's leaders didn't need to look far to see such fervor sweeping France. Moreover, one of the things the American colonists despised was that they had been compelled to accept and absorb British prisoners as part of the British metropolitan penal regime. Under Britain's infamous Bloody Code, a system of crime and punishment that listed 160 offenses as punishable by death, transportation existed as a lesser punishment. By the end of the 18th century, an enlightened judicial bench was increasingly disinclined to inflict public hanging on malefactors guilty of nothing more than petty theft, in particular in a society characterized by deeply entrenched and widespread poverty. The result of this was that transportation, as a codified punishment, became a more popular option. As a result, while convicted men and women might suffer the difficulties of de facto slavery in the American colonies, they were at least spared the gallows. With the signing of the Declaration of Independence, America was no longer available as a dumping ground for British criminals, and while the judicial system continued to hand down sentences of transportation, they were gathered by the tens of thousands in pestilent hulk ships moored up to contain them, 
The metropolitan prison system was crude and inadequate at best, and as men lingered and died on prison ships, the ruling establishment wrung its hands and worried about what was to be done. Alternative destinations for transported convicts were explored, among them the west coast of Africa, known then as the White Man's Grave, but this was deeply unpopular. It was generally agreed that it would be more humane to send a man or a woman to the gallows than to the African tropics, where death would be slower and more painful, but no less inevitable. Thus, New Holland began increasingly to find itself the subject of discussion as parliamentarians and social reformers in England pondered the convict question. There was a tendency to use the idea of a penal colony as the reason for British interest in the place altogether, which made the placement of an actual penal colony there all the more sensible. Though it usually remained unspoken, Australia offered the added advantage of being so far away that the loss to society of its unruly elements would more than likely be permanent. As such, on May 13, 1787, when the first fleet sailed from England, a majority of its human cargo were carried in six transport ships that lumbered behind the fleeter Royal Navy ships. These convicts numbered 717, 197 of whom were women. They were in practical terms the stock upon which the colony would be founded. It must certainly have been both thrilling and unnerving for all concerned to disembark in possibly the most remote corner of the habitable world, totally beyond help and recall, and supplied entirely from the outside. And indeed, the first few years of the colony's existence were bleak and hungry. Early attempts at agriculture were not successful, and as convicts continued to be landed, supplies were tenuous and conditions primitive in the extreme. Much of the problem, as most written history tends to point out, lay with the type of people that Philip and his administrative personnel had to work with. From the beginning, the administration was completely and dangerously outnumbered by convicts. In fact, between 1788 and 1792, about 3,546 male and 766 female convicts arrived in the colony. Very few of these were skilled, most were professional criminals, and very few felt any particular sense of destiny with regards to their surroundings. They were under penal servitude, and as such they were de facto slaves. On top of that, they represented the scrapings of the British prison system. Convicts with trades or skills were typically held back in England, meaning only those of absolutely no worth at all were loaded onto transport ships destined for New South Wales. Eventually, a settlement was founded on Norfolk Island in 1788, mainly to relieve pressure on resources in Sydney. Philip then sent various expeditions in search of somewhere with better soils, and in due course a site was identified at what is today the Sydney suburb of Parramatta. Another was placed at Toongabby. While difficulties continued, under the momentum of convict labor, a formal settlement soon began to take shape. Sydney Cove developed as a port, but most of the early population moved inland and settled. As emancipated convicts and new arrivals of free settlers expanded the non-captive population, a general society emerged that was recognizable as English, and by the time Governor Philip retired in December 1792 and returned to England, some 2,000 acres of land lay under cultivation in and around Parramatta. Back in England, a liberal generation, still energized by the successful abolition campaign that at last became law in 1807, cast a critical eye upon the transportation of convicts. Concerns were expressed over the manner in which it was done, and the uses made of the convicts once they landed in New South Wales. In time, people began to question whether the system was a new form of slavery. One such early social reformer, the Earl Grey, remarked in his book Colonial Policy, The assigned servants were in fact slaves, and there is only too painful proof that in many instances the evils inseparable from slavery were experienced. This certainly was a ticklish point, and as the liberal establishment agonized over it, lawyers strove to define the difference between property in the person, as in slavery, and property in the services, as was true in the case of transportation. Insofar as the services could not be rendered without the person, the difference was somewhat arcane. Convicts were to be housed, clothed, and fed by the government, and they were paid a small amount for their labor often in the form of tea, sugar, or tobacco, 
but some would no doubt fall into the hands of a cruel master. As had at one time been remarked upon ironically in regard to slavery, and later in regard to Indian and Chinese indentured labor, the liberal lobby wrung its hands over conditions of bonded labor, even as it ignored the deplorable domestic conditions of labor in the new factories of the Midlands, the coal and tin mines, and the farms of England. There is a huge archive of anecdotal material detailing the harsh regimes in all of the penal settlements eventually established in the colony, and the gallows and flogging frame certainly were a well-used accoutrement of any prison yard. Australian historian Ernest Scott, writing in 1916, noted that the discipline imposed was often ferociously harsh. The lash and the noose swung ever ready and were freely employed. After a rebellion of Irish convicts, fifteen ringleaders were summarily hung in one batch, and others received sentences of two hundred, five hundred, and even a thousand lashes with the cat o' nine tails. As soon as a wretch had recovered from the prostration caused by one portion of his sentence, he was taken out and given another. As the nineteenth century progressed and the colony began to develop along more conventional lines, it attracted a steady arrival of free settlers and the mood of the entire penal transportation enterprise began to change. In the early years, transportation had been a source of terror, which offered up some value as a deterrent, but by the early 1800s, the New South Wales colony was established, and the prospect of immigration from the British Isles to Australia was becoming increasingly attractive. At the same time, a cumulative series of rebellions in Ireland— and similar unrest in Scotland, brought the arrival in New South Wales of a rather different type of transportee. Ultimately, of the 160,000 convicts transported to Australia between 1788 and 1868, 50,000 were Irish, and a vast majority of them were political prisoners. Quite a number of them were educated men, as were a great many Scottish and Welsh rebels who arrived from time to time for precisely the same reason. These rebels, the Irish in particular, were often guilty of no specific crime, but they brought with them to Australia, a British colony, all of their innate and deep-seated hatred for the British. In an environment where criminals predominated, instances of unrest or rebellion were almost unheard of, but it was the Irish who usually could be found at the root of any that did take place. Their refusal to submit and their unwillingness to acknowledge British jurisdiction over them set in motion a turbulent time for the colony. Rebellions in 1803 and 1804, for example, were brutally crushed, and the harshest sentences of death and flogging were usually reserved for those Irishmen accused of instigating it. In this regard, the governor, Captain Philip Gidley King, could not be seen to be lenient, bearing in mind that a general insurrection among prisoners would entirely overwhelm the forces of law and order. Another issue was the informal alliance between the French and the Irish during the Napoleonic Wars. If the French were to attempt a takeover of New South Wales, they could certainly rely on the Irish rebels, some two thousand in all, to help them. As Ernest Scott put it, the Irish were far more troublesome than all the forgers, burglars, and thieves with whom the governors had to deal. In 1818, the Home Secretary, First Viscount Sidmouth, addressed the House of Commons. In his speech, he remarked that the dread of transportation was now a thing of the past, and that it had been succeeded by a common desire for immigration to that colony that had once held such terrors. This created a situation whereby the lot of the transported convict was deemed less horrifying, and incidents were recorded of British soldiers stationed in Australia committing felonious crimes in order to secure the permanent right of abode in the new colony, and some of the benefits bestowed on emancipists once they entered free life. Emancipists were, indeed, quite often able to integrate and live entirely normal lives, availing themselves of land allocations, entering the various branches of the administration, and periodically appearing on the bench and the executive. By the end of Governor Lachlan Macquarie's term of office in 1821, some 40,000 souls resided in Sydney, and the various satellite settlements of the colony, and some 350,000 acres of land lay under occupation. In fact, the governorship of Major General Lachlan Macquarie, between 1810 and 1821, marked something of a sea change in this regard. His predecessor, William Bly, brought his brutal and uncompromising attitude to the administration of the colony. He inherited a system of gubernatorial autocracy not dissimilar to his navy command. 
and of it he made very similar use. The distance from Britain and the nature of the colony in its early years tended to justify this. The colony was in practical terms a prison, with a superficial free administration, and Bly and his predecessors were obliged to rule the settlement in the manner of prison governors. Macquarie, however, although arriving in the colony with similar powers, was of an inclination to modernize and streamline a very primitive system of the government of New South Wales. It cannot be said that he removed himself entirely from high-handed and dictatorial practices of his predecessors, but he is typically regarded as the last of the tyrants, and William Bly was certainly the worst of these. Macquarie arrived with a battalion of the 73rd Regiment of Foot. Part of his mandate, and certainly the reason that he arrived so heavily armed, was to bring to heel and dissolve the New South Wales Corps. The NSWC, an unruly body of armed men, were raised initially to police the colony, but they were prone to corruption, undisciplined, and certainly antagonistic towards the administration. Some decommissioned members remained in the colony, and some were absorbed into the 73rd, but most were repatriated back to England. From that point onwards, until 1870, a detachment of imperial troops was rotated in the colony for the time being, removing the role of defense from any locally constituted militia. Macquarie therefore governed with the same overarching authority as his predecessors, but under his term, the first discussion of the formation of some sort of advisory council as a precursor to the establishment of a domestic legislature was heard. The matter was put before the House of Commons in 1812 and it was agreed that such a council would be desirable. But this was promptly overruled by the Secretary of State for the Colonies, the Earl of Bathurst, who was disinclined to consider a diminishment of the powers of his office in favor of any local body. The authority of Whitehall was exercised through his appointed governor. Nonetheless, the matter was now on the table, and inevitably at some point it would be acted upon. In 1823, Upon publication of the Commission's report, the House of Commons passed the New South Wales Judicature Act, which established for the first time a legislative council. This was not quite yet home rule, or even representative rule, but it was a start. The legislative council would consist of not more than seven, and no fewer than five, members, and it served in practical terms only as an advisory committee for the governor appointed by the Crown, and only empowered to debate bills tabled by the Governor. However, crucially, if the Governor proposed a law, and a simple majority of the Legislative Council did not approve it, that law could proceed no further except on appeal to the Imperial Government. Meanwhile, the beginning of the end of organized penal transportation came with the review of a parliamentary select committee undertaken between 1837 and 1838. Under the weight of two substantial reports, the essential conclusion was that transportation did not deter crime, but it did debase the social quality of the colonies. This subsequently led to a commission of inquiry, the Molesworth Commission. Much of the impetus for both of these was the work of an early penal reformer and human rights advocate by the name of Alexander McConaughey. McConaughey was a tall and rather austere man, a Royal Navy captain and a founding member of the Royal Society, who accepted the position of private secretary to Governor Sir John Franklin. McConaughey was, in effect, a spy, implanted by the liberal humanitarian movement in Britain to report back in a balanced manner on conditions for convicts on the island. His report, when finally complete, created an enormous stir both in England and in Van Diemen's land, the former because of the deplorable conditions described, and the latter because an unwelcome light was suddenly shining on practices long kept hidden. The episode contributed to the recall of Governor John Franklin and triggered a general parliamentary review. It is also fair to note that a general movement towards liberal humanitarianism was going on back home, so the antiquated British penal code was ripe for review and revision. The great prison reformer Elizabeth Fry led a movement of interested parties, within which McConaughey was the undisputed technical expert, and this movement acknowledged the anachronistic nature of the entire tradition of transportation. The Parliamentary Select Committee took a great deal of testimony from influential sources within the colony, where a strong movement also existed for the practice to end. In this case, it had less to do with humanitarian concerns and more to do with the unfair competition created by free labor. 
Of course, colonists in Australia also worried about typical security concerns that arise in a society so dominated by criminal elements. In short, penal transportation had run its course, and it was now simply a matter of dismantling it as quickly as British parliamentary procedures would allow. McConaughey's condemnatory report prompted an immediate revision of prison conditions in lieu of abolition. Up to 1836, the system had introduced a round figure of 100,000 convicts to Australia, and on that date some 45,000 remained detained under various terms in several locations. Most of these were common criminals, along with occasional political prisoners and a handful of what were quaintly known as gentlemen convicts. Transportation to New South Wales ended in 1840, but facilities on Norfolk Island and Van Diemen's Land remained operational, with administrative responsibility for the former shifting eventually to Hobart. Van Diemen's Land remained the only functioning penal colony, including Norfolk Island, which was reserved as a receptacle for the hardest cases and those convicted of additional crimes during their terms of transportation. The ongoing transportation of convicts to Van Diemen's Land was opposed by a number of local societies and organizations, including the Australasian Anti-Transportation League, various civic and church groups, and numerous organizations and bodies in the United Kingdom itself. The practice was suspended briefly in 1846, but it was quickly revived when immediate overcrowding in British metropolitan prisons began to be felt. By then, terms of imprisonment had in any case been redefined, and convicts were now termed exiles. Since the entire system was now under consistent review, the worst excesses of treatment and conditions had eased considerably. The last convict ship dispatched from England to Van Diemen's Land, the St. Vincent, arrived in 1853, and the final ship to leave England, the Ugamont, left in 1867 and arrived in Western Australia on January 10, 1868. Among the early colonies, South Australia was the only one that never accepted convicts from Britain, but it did accept convicts from within the region. In tandem with the end of the convict system, British settlement became more absolute. The practical acquisition and distribution of land had always been haphazard, ad hoc, and largely unregulated, and it took a considerable amount of time for the British government to embrace the inevitability that, having set the process in motion, sovereignty over the entire continent would simply be a matter of time. The government, therefore, seemed always to be several steps behind the facts on the ground. This also was aided by the vast distances involved, the autocratic powers granted early governors, and the different styles of government that each operated. The Victorian Gold Rush By 1854, Australia consisted of New South Wales, Victoria, Van Diemen's Land, renamed Tasmania two years later, South Australia, and Western Australia. Convict transportation had been abolished and the majority of immigrants were free pastoralists and farmers drawn by the prospect of cheap and freely available land. In time, a social divide between free settlers and emancipated convicts and their children grew, despite the fact that many convicts had become successful and made weighty contributions to their colonies. The discovery of large deposits of gold in New South Wales and Victoria prompted an enormous increase in immigration. Large numbers of would-be prospectors from all over the world headed to the gold fields at Ballarat, which previously consisted of little more than a few squatters' huts, but quickly became a city of over 100,000 people. In just a few months, the site was transformed into a makeshift settlement of tents and crude huts, and by 1852 the government of Victoria stepped in to create a formal township for the thousand or so prospectors. Soon there was a post office and police station as well as a number of stores and agencies which tended to make more money than most individual prospectors ever made. Life on the goldfield was tough. For the most part, prospectors lived in ramshackle dwellings of tarpaulin, bark, or possibly stone, generally erected above the creeks and streams where they panned for gold so as to avoid flooding. They needed a license to prospect a small area. These were first issued on September 1851 and cost 30 shillings about 150 U.S. dollars, a month. Most prospectors found this fee difficult, if not impossible, to pay, and most did not strike it rich, but struggled to support themselves and their families. Food was basic, 
generally consisting of mutton cooked with potatoes and onions and damper, unleavened scones without milk or butter, and tea. Fruit and vegetables were rare until the Chinese gold miners established market gardens. The inadequate diet, poor housing and sanitation, harsh climate, and the fact that miners worked in water encouraged diseases such as pneumonia and influenza. Broken bones could lead to infection and were frequently fatal. Bites from the numerous venomous snakes were also common, and sadly children often fell to diphtheria and scarlet fever. For a long time doctors, let alone hospitals, were scarce, and even if they did come, they were expensive. Moreover, they were mostly immigrants themselves, with little to no knowledge of Australian conditions. Violence on the goldfields was common enough, though perhaps not as frequent as many historians suppose, due to lack of police officers, troopers, the difficulty of the terrain, and the general remoteness of the area. Prospectors would often try to jump another's claim, that is, work it surreptitiously or openly eject the original claimant, and inevitably thieves pillaged gold, equipment, and supplies. Such crimes were often dealt with by the miners themselves, with one storekeeper displaying a severed hand on a counter as a warning. The sound of firearms warning jumpers and thieves was often heard throughout the night, and not uncommonly, the threats were actually followed up on and carried out. The young British-born journalist Henry Britton, 1843 to 1938, wrote, Two miners sleeping there, at Forest Creek, another Victorian goldfield, heard the discomposing sound, so like a mouse running up the canvas wall, of a pair of scissors slitting the canvas. A pistol was fired in the direction of the supposed thief, and when the two miners went out to see the result, they found a well-dressed young man lying dead with a bullet in his chest. He did not look like one of the lawless class, and it was not at all clear that he had intended robbery. He was buried next day without any information having been obtained in regard to him. This is one of the many ways in which people mysteriously disappeared on the diggings, to be afterwards advertised for by their friends in vain. Willful homicide also occurred, with the perpetrators often escaping justice. In the absence of sufficient police, the community would often execute justice themselves, holding trials with elected judges and juries. The journalist John Marshall described the response to a man accused of stealing gold. Bull, thoroughly angered by his obstinacy, then said, I shall call a roll-up then, and seizing a tin dish from the store, he beat a tattoo on it, which soon brought all the diggers into the camp to see what important matter was on hand that anyone should call a roll-up on a Sunday morning. When the whole of the diggers had assembled, Bull mounted a wagon and briefly told his story. As he proceeded, there were loud cries of, Hang the wretch, string him up, and other threats of a similar character, couched in less elegant, though more expressive, language. It was decided that a formal trial should take place, and that a judge should be appointed, and the diggers in a body should act as a jury. The most frequent crime on the gold fields was stealing, for which the penalty was frequently exiled. In that situation, the culprit would be given enough food and water to last until he reached the next settlement. However, more organized forms of stealing could not be dealt with so expeditiously. Carriages taking gold to Melbourne for sale and export were escorted by the British 40th Regiment, and by police troopers, many of whom were aboriginals. But this did not prevent organized gangs, the famous bush rangers, from occasionally attacking the escorts and stealing the gold. These highwaymen were usually escaped convicts, often from Van Diemen's land, and knew the countryside well enough to hide from authorities and ambush travelers. Later, they would be succeeded by free-born robbers, including the notorious Ned Kelly. The European inhabitants of Ballarat also lashed out against the Chinese community. Many immigrants from the Chinese Empire came to New South Wales and Victorian goldfields looking for riches, not seeking their own fortunes, but to alleviate the grinding poverty in which their families lived. Peasant families in China generally lived on less than a hectare of land and labored to pay onerous taxes. Therefore, the money the prospectors made was sent back to China. Europeans were offended by their reluctance to invest in Australia, as well as by cultural differences. They were despised for introducing opium use and for their success, which was due to industry and hard work rather than nefarious practices. They would often make profitable claims that others had abandoned, and generate income from stores and gardens, 
The law protected the Chinese, but the lack of a police presence meant that many Chinese were robbed and beaten. The government appointed a Chinese protector, whose reach was often ineffectual. The government of Victoria had only been established in July 1851, barely six months after the discovery of the goldfields. It was initially part of the Port Phillip district, but it was then separated from New South Wales and became the colony of Victoria, with its capital at Melbourne, then a town of 23,000 inhabitants. Within months, the population of the city doubled. Consisting of many immigrants on their way to the gold fields, living in tent cities along the banks of Melbourne's Yarra River. Exponential growth in the colony posed challenges for Lieutenant Governor Charles Joseph Latrobe, 1801 to 1875, a highly cultured man of wide interests, but little administrative experience. He had governed the Port Phillip district before separation, but under the supervision of the Governor of New South Wales, Major Sir George Gipps. 1791 to 1847. Unlike previous governors of Australian colonies, Latrobe was neither an army nor a naval officer, and he was conscious of his lack of experience. The inhabitants of Melbourne expressed no confidence in Latrobe, citing trivial matters of administration and the fact that he was not a strong supporter of separation. The colonial office in London, the organ of government responsible for the imperial colonies, also voiced certain anxieties about his administration, though Gipps steadfastly maintained that he was able. In 1850, the British Parliament passed legislation which enabled the Australian colonies to establish their own legislatures. So Victoria had a legislative council and an executive council. Twenty of the members of the legislative council were elected by a restricted franchise of wealthy landowners. While the remaining ten were nominated by the lieutenant governor, an executive council consisting of four members appointed by the governor served as an upper house with power to veto bills and control the budget. Thus, Latrobe exercised almost complete power when the Victorian gold rush began. The flight to the diggings at Ballarat, Ararat, Castlemaine, and other areas almost emptied the town of Melbourne of its taxable population. Therefore, Latrobe enacted the thirty shilling a month license and imposed it immediately before the prospectors had an opportunity to acquire sufficient quantities of gold. However, the government did not have the manpower to efficiently collect the fee, and Latrobe had to raise wages to grow the constabulary. He also requested the colonial office send more troops to maintain order. As in New South Wales, a goldfields commission was established in Victoria to administer the diggings. Each field had a gold commissioner appointed by the colonial officer, usually a young British gentleman with little, if any, experience of colonial life. His principal qualifications seemed to be his breeding and generous salaries, seven hundred pounds a year, were provided to attract applicants. In theory, the duties were onerous, with the colonial office instructing them that your chief business will be to protect the interests of the crown in matters of revenue. And it will be an essential part of your duty to preserve the peace, to put down outrage and violence, and to protect the community generally. They were provided with assistant commissioners and a detachment of troopers in order to achieve this goal. They were generally looked upon with derision by the population of the goldfields on account of their affected demeanor, pseudo-military uniforms, and lack of local knowledge. Petty tyrants encased in musical comedy uniforms was how one digger described them. They were a glitter with buttons and braid, and eating their heads off at the expense of a community ill-fitted to subsidize such parasites. An opinion corroborated by at least one commissioner, who wrote, "Those were snug times. We had handsome salaries, all our expenses paid, as many servants as we pleased, all paid for, and nothing to do but order whatever we choose and send in the accounts." This was the setting in the Victorian goldfields in the early 1850s. There were tens of thousands of people from all over the world, all seeking their fortunes, and for the most part, poor. Conditions were harsh and primitive. Crime abounded, and there was a lack of authority. What lawkeepers who did exist were generally concerned with their own comforts and did not understand the populations in their charge, and in any case, they lacked the manpower to keep order. Furthermore. The governor of the colony was preoccupied with collecting revenue above keeping the peace, and his inexperience had not prepared him for such a swift and massive growth in the population. Therefore, communities distrusted the police and administered justice themselves. Inevitably, tensions between the prospectors and the government started to grow. <laughs>
and it seemed to be just a matter of time before the situation degenerated into a violent conflict. The Ballarat Reform League In January 1852, Latrobe outraged the gold mining community by raising the monthly licensing fee to a staggering three pounds, an impossible imposition beyond the thirty shillings which was not being uniformly collected anyway. The governor was in urgent need of funds to pay for the administration of the gold fields, but a concerted effort by the miners, many of whom gathered arms, and the press forced a humiliating retreat, further eroding confidence in the government. Next, Latrobe sought to staff the gold fields and provide facilities and amenities for the people from the general revenue of the colony, but was blocked by the legislative council. The increase in population also made the release of more agricultural lands necessary, and that brought him into conflict with squatters already occupying unsold land who objected to the high prices. Exhausted and thwarted at every turn, and plagued by his own lack of confidence, Latrobe offered his resignation to the British government in December 1852, yet he would not be relieved until May 5, 1854. In the meantime, he continued to struggle with the situation in the goldfields. In July 1853, a group of protesters based in the mining town of Bendigo, calling themselves the Anti-Gold License Association, presented Latrobe with a petition bearing more than 23,000 signatures. They wanted a license fee reduced to ten shillings, and declared that if this was not done, they would not pay the license at all. Moreover, they wanted to be able to own their claims outright, and to be granted representation in the Legislative Council. This was the first indication that the agitation had grown beyond dissatisfaction with the gold licenses. The members of the association wore red ribbons, which was notable since red represented the color of revolution. In response, the governor sent most of the colony's troops to Bendigo. Latrobe had the sense to realize he was dealing with a potential revolt, so he acceded to the demands of the association, at least in regard to the licenses. To replace the revenue, he proposed introducing an export tax on gold. A sensible measure might have done much to defuse a potentially volatile situation, but the Legislative Council, composed of wealthy landowners unwilling to share power with miners, rejected it. Instead, the Council pressured Latrobe into executing an Act for the Better Management of the Goldfields in the Colony of Victoria, which in December 1853 authorized gold commissioners to conduct random searches to ensure miners had licenses. At the same time, more troops arrived in the colony. This was the state of affairs that Latrobe left in the colony when he was replaced by Charles Hotham, a naval officer, as was customary in gubernatorial appointments. He was received with hopeful enthusiasm after the disorderly reign of Latrobe, and straight away he recognized the two most urgent problems facing the colony, the lack of revenue and the inadequacy of the government of the goldfields. In response to the second, he personally examined the goldfields, something his predecessor had not done, and undertook to look into the miners' living conditions. At first this appealed to the discontented miners, but it soon became apparent that they had misinterpreted the governor's temperament. Hotham had been appointed with the brief to restore order. He was an authoritarian, and he treated the unrest as a rebellion. The Europe which he had just left was still reeling from the liberal revolutions of 1848, and although the United Kingdom had been largely unaffected, it still grappled with the Chartist movement which sought to reform the electoral system. Hotham and the elitist Legislative Council saw the Anti-Gold License Association as a revolutionary organization committed to the overthrow of the established order. This was not to say he had no sympathy whatsoever with the grievances of the miners, because he did in fact acknowledge that the incompetence and malfeasance of public officials had contributed to the volatility in Victoria, but he had a job to do. Hotham's answer to the revenue problem was reactionary. In a show of force as much as a grab for revenue, he vigorously enforced the 1853 Licensing Act, much to the outrage of the miners. Making things worse, on October 7, 1854, a Scottish miner by the name of James Scobie was found dead in the Eureka Hotel at Ballarat. The establishment was owned by James Bentley, and he and two of his employees, Thomas Farrell and William Hance, were accused of manslaughter and subsequently acquitted. <laughs>
Irregularities were observed during the coroner's inquest, including allowing the accused Bentley to cross-examine a ten-year-old witness and permitting conversations between Bentley and the coroner while the jurors were deliberating. Rumors of police corruption and malfeasance were rife through the goldfields, and an angry crowd of 30,000 gathered outside the Eureka Hotel on October 17th and set fire to it. Maurice Ziminis, commander of the Ballarat police troopers, facilitated the escape of Bentley and wife Catherine, but had the good sense not to attempt to disperse the crowd. On October 23rd, 4,000 miners met at Ballarat to protest the arrest of three men for the burning of the hotel. They resolved to establish a Diggers' Rights Society to protect their rights against police corruption and government maladministration. On November 1st, another meeting of 10,000 gathered at Bakery Hill, the hub of Ballarat where all roads converged. Ten days later, an assembly of similar size established the Ballarat Reform League for the purposes of representing the miners' views and demands to the Victorian government. The League formalized the demands of the miners, including abolition of licenses, universal male suffrage, abolition of property qualifications for members of the Legislative Council, the payment of members of Parliament, the disbanding of the Gold Commission, and the release of those men arrested for the burning of the Eureka Hotel. Its political demands were those of the Chartist movement in Britain. It passed a revolution that it is the inalienable right of every citizen to have a voice in making the laws he is called on to obey, that taxation without representation is tyranny. The League's elected secretary was John Basson Humphrey, a Welsh-born miner with a legal background and Chartist sympathies. For Humphrey there was no question of an armed rebellion against the government, as he instead believed that moral force would achieve their aims. However, a meeting of the League did resolve to secede from Britain if their demands were not met. The Ballarat Reform League offered to negotiate with the government through Humphrey and two other prominent leaders of the League, George Black and Tom Kennedy, and for a time it seemed that reconciliation was possible. On November 16, 1854, Hotham announced that he had appointed a royal commission to look into the matter of miners' grievances, but there was only so much that he could do personally. The matter of representation, for instance, would have to be referred to the Legislative Council and in March, Latrobe had already sent a bill to extend the franchise to license holders with residence qualifications for its consideration. That said, the sympathy shown by the governor appeared to be encouraging. The commissioner of Ballarat since May 1854, Robert William Reed, 1815-1904, also showed a degree of empathy for the miners, but felt personally humiliated by the burning of the Eureka Hotel, which his police had been powerless to prevent. Thus he was determined to teach the miners a fearful lesson. For all of his sensitivity to the miners' grievances, Hotham was determined that Chartism should not take root in the Australian colonies. In the United Kingdom, Chartists advocated for the democratic participation of the non-propertied classes, and they were widely associated with civil unrest. At the same time, Hotham did not want to rush into a confrontation, and he believed he had time to negotiate. He knew that there was a division growing within the League between those who urged negotiation and those who advocated a show of force. Humphrey maintained that moral force was sufficient to achieve the League's aims, while the Irishman Peter Lawler was prepared to use force. Lawler, 1827-1889, was an Irish-born miner and son of Patrick Lawler, an Irish nationalist and the first Catholic member of Parliament for his county since the reign of King James II reigning 1685 to 1688. Peter's brothers Richard and James were also advocates for Irish nationalism. Peter Lawler was one of a million Irish who emigrated during the terrible potato famine. Hotham figured it would be only a matter of time before weaknesses emerged that he and Commissioner Reed might exploit to their advantage. But as it turned out, a rapid succession of events brought matters to a head. On November 23rd, James Bentley was convicted of the manslaughter of Scobie after a retrial. This was welcomed by the miners, but any prospect of being placated was dashed by the November 25th conviction of the three men, Fletcher, McIntyre, and Westerby, arrested after the burning of the Eureka Hotel. They were not convicted of arson, but of inciting a riot. On the same day, the Ballarat Times, 
a newspaper sympathetic to the miners, published an article deemed seditious by Commissioner Reed, who was becoming increasingly alarmed by the mood at the diggings. Two days later, Humphrey, Black, and Kennedy met with the governor, with a message from the League demanding the three men's immediate release. This was a fatal mistake, because Hotham was prepared to negotiate and even compromise, but he would not cave to demands. To him, the convictions of the three men were acts of justice. Bentley was behind bars, and Hotham had convened a commission to look into the miners' grievances. There was nothing more that justice required, and anything more would be capitulating. He saw this demand as a direct attempt to subvert the colony of Victoria and drew a line in the sand, insisting the prisoners would not be released. As the three emissaries, probably aware that the die had been cast, returned to the goldfields, Hotham ordered troops in Melbourne to march on Ballarat. Alerted to the imminent arrival of the soldiers, over 10,000 miners met at Bakery Hill on November 29th. The moderate Humphrey had lost sway, and the miners were addressed by Peter Lawler, one of the more extremist members of the League. After raising the Southern Cross, commonly known as the Eureka Flag, a banner of five white stars emblazoned on a blue field, Lawler addressed the crowd. The only eyewitness account of his speech was recorded by a miner named Raffaello Carboni. Peter Lawler, our commander-in-chief, was on the stump, holding with his left hand the muzzle of his rifle, whose butt-end rested on its foot. A gesture of his right hand signified what he meant when he said, It is my duty now to swear you in and to take with you the oath to be faithful to the Southern Cross. Hear me with attention. The man who, after this solemn oath, does not stand by our standard, is a coward in heart. I order all persons who do not intend to take the oath to leave the meeting at once. Let all divisions under arms fall in in their order round the flagstaff. The movement was made accordingly. Some five hundred armed diggers advanced in real sober earnestness, captains of each division making the military salute to Lawler, who now knelt down, the head uncovered, and with the right hand pointing to the standard, exclaimed a firm, measured tone, We swear by the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other and fight to defend our rights and liberties. A universal, well-rounded amen was the determined reply. Some five hundred right hands stretched towards our flag. The earnestness of so many faces of all kinds of shape and color the motley heads of all sorts of size and hair, the shagginess of so many beards of all lengths and thicknesses, the vividness of double the number of eyes electrified by the magnetism of the Southern Cross, was one of those grand sights such as are recorded only in the history of the Crusaders in Palestine. Carboni himself took the podium afterwards and told the audience, And so I call you, all my fellow diggers, irrespective of nationality, religion, and color, to salute the Southern Cross as the refuge of all the oppressed from all countries on earth. The miners publicly burned their licenses, and what began as a protest against working conditions had become a call to universal revolution. The famous Eureka flag was made of white cotton and blue wool, composed of five white stars on a white cross to stylistically depict the Southern Cross constellation. The Southern Cross was already used by colonial banners, but what made the flag notorious was the absence of the Union Jack. It was reputed to have been designed by a Canadian miner, Captain Henry Ross, 1829-1854, who modeled it after the contemporary Federation flag, an attempt to design a common flag for the Australian colonies. The Federation flag had a Union Jack and white stars on a blue cross against a white background. The white cross joining the stars represented unity in defiance of oppression. Legend attributes the fabrication of the banner to three local women, named Anne Duke, Anastasia Hayes, and Anastasia Withers. The following day, Henry Ross took down the Southern Cross and led a march of one thousand diggers from Bakery Hill to the stockade at Eureka Lead, a short distance away. There the banner was raised on a pole in the center of the grounds and later that afternoon, seven captains, including Ross, were appointed for the defense of the Eureka camp. The revolt could have been avoided, and even now bloodshed was not inevitable. Another governor, other than Hotham, might have thought that it could have been avoided, and even Latrobe, for all his inadequacies, would probably have found a peaceable way forward. But Hotham considered it a rebellion led by Irish Chartists intent on subverting the British Empire, and Commissioner Reed backed him.
Thus, despite knowing that the licenses had been burned, he ordered the arrest of any miner who could not produce one. Peter Lawler would write later that the first victim of the crisis fell on November 30th. On Thursday morning, the police and military came out to look for licenses. A digger, who I presume had no license, was running away, when an officer of police ordered his men to fire on him, to shoot him down, and he was fired at. I positively assert that the riot act had not been read when the digger was fired at. See Mr. S. Cummings' evidence before the Gold Commission. In fact, the diggers believed that some of those in authority had come out that morning with the determination of having the diggers fired on. The first and only pitched battle between the government and its own people on Australian soil was about to take place. The Battle of Eureka It's still possible at this point that a show of force was all that was required. For of the thousands who cheered Lawler and his confederates on November 29th, only five hundred remained to build a ramshackle stockade. The rest had returned to their diggings, and Reed's spies informed the governor of that. Most diggers would have known that they could not possibly prevail against the British troops, and it's reasonable to assume the protesters only wished to make a show of resistance in order to resume negotiations. The capital of Melbourne was certainly not in danger, and it is doubtful that the insurrection would have spread beyond the goldfields. Perhaps Hotham did in fact fear a successful revolution that would spread to the goldfields of New South Wales and from there disrupt all the Australian colonies, but even this does not explain the calculated ruthlessness that followed, and the actions of the governor during the crisis aimed to goad the miners into violence. For example, the instructions to Reed to conduct license searches, knowing that most had been destroyed, certainly had this effect. Miners resisted Reed's searches, with many arrested, and others blocking the way of the mounted troopers. There were still hearts and minds anxious to avoid bloodshed, in particular those of the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church. The Diocese of Melbourne had been established in 1838, when Victoria was still part of New South Wales with James Gould as its first bishop. A large proportion of the population of the goldfields were Irish and European Catholics, so Gould and his clergy knew the situation very well. They knew equally well that despite the legal emancipation of Catholics in 1829, sectarianism still dominated politics, and the Catholic, mostly Irish, population was viewed as potentially seditious. Sensing a confrontation was imminent, Gould and two priests, Patrick Smith, and Matthew Downing, journeyed to Ballarat ahead of the November 29th meeting. Gould wrote in his diary, I arrived in Ballarat at ten this morning, after traveling the whole night. The diggers are very much excited. I conversed with two persons, seemingly leaders of two different sections of the diggers, and parties to the present movement. I used every persuasive argument to induce them to abandon the meeting they called for this evening, but did not succeed. However, they assured me that they would use all their influence to keep it within the bounds of peace and order. They complained of the overbearing conduct of the officials, of the frequent and offensive inquiries after their licenses at all hours by the troopers. I think a little kindness and forbearance on the part of the officials in police would have gone far in conciliating them. It is, however, now too late. They appear to know their own strength and the weakness of the government. Reverend Patrick Smith was the priest of St. Olypius's church in Ballarat, and attended a number of meetings of the Reform League with the aim of encouraging peaceful resistance to the harsh measures of Hotham and Reed. His self-assurance, sympathy, and kindness greatly recommended him to the miners, and he was elected to a delegation to the government. A letter from Smith to Bishop Gould expressed his anxiety after the failed mission to Hotham on November 27th. I really don't know how to act. What am I to do? My impression is that everything tends to an insurrection. On the night of December 2nd, Smith called upon Lawler and the other miners at the stockade to communicate details of the military force nearby and asked them to stand down. The 12th and 40th had left their encampment at Balan and marched about 40 kilometers to the west, arriving at Ballarat on the night of November 28th. En route, the 12th was attacked by angry miners resulting in injuries to a military wagon driver, a publican, and a drummer boy. 
Captain John Wellesley Thomas was charged with suppressing what was being unambiguously termed an insurrection. The troops had battle experience, and Thomas had fought in the First Anglo-Afghan War of 1841-42. to From the two regiments, he handpicked a force of 276 soldiers and police troopers. This group would take the stockade while the bulk of the military remained to keep order on the goldfields. The stockade was erected on Stockyard Reserve along the road to Melbourne, about two kilometers east of Bakery Hill, and was composed of spiked timbers, brushwood, overturned carts, and whatever else was available. Obviously, it was never intended to be a military installation, but rather a camp for the miners who were prepared to use arms. The perimeter of the stockade enclosed half a hectare with several tents, stores, and mining claims. Lawler never meant to make a stand against the British forces there. If a fight took place, he hoped to have it take place in the nearby gravel pits, where there were a series of mining structures on top of mounds, as well as wells encased in timbers that could be used as defenses. If the miners were forced to concede that ground, they were to make a last stand on the heights of Canadian Gully, a few kilometers to the south. The miners were joined by a group of 200 American diggers calling themselves the Independent Californian Rangers Revolver Brigade. Their leader, James McGill, claimed to have been trained at West Point under the name of McGillicuddy. He and his men entered the stockade on December 2nd and organized a set of sentries to alert the miners of the arrival of the soldiers. Many of them were veterans of the Mexican-American War and were better disciplined and armed than most of their Confederates. Between November 28th and December 3rd, the miners believed they were secured. The troops already stationed in the town had not attacked, and the diggers believed they were waiting for reinforcements from Melbourne. The diggers freely moved in and out of the stockade, and Reed's spies within the perimeter told him everything. Furthermore, Hotham had been giving indications that there would be no attack, leading them to believe that negotiations would resume. In reality, he was telling the military and the police something entirely different. The government spies urged Lawler to go on the offensive, drawing the miners into the open and giving the government the moral advantage of saying its troops were attacked. But Lawler stood firm, and Carboni would later write that we meant to organize for defense, and that we had taken up arms for no other purpose. The spies reported this to the government camp and Captain Thomas thereupon resolved upon a surprise attack to demolish the stockade before Lawler and his men could escape. He would attack the stockade on Sunday, December 3rd. At this time, Sunday was still widely respected as a day of rest and worship, and it was considered unthinkable that troops should dishonor the day by shedding blood. The rules of war demanded that the besieged be at least offered terms and given an opportunity to surrender, and Hotham would be justly criticized for failing to do so. He cannot be excused on the grounds that he did not know what Thomas was planning, because from the very beginning of the crisis the governor was in complete control, and the military was squarely under his command. Around 3 a.m. on Sunday, Thomas led his 276 men under a full moon into the gully which wound through the cattle yards about a kilometer east of the stockade. Just as dawn began to break, sentries spotted the approaching troops and fired. The command, Forward, was heard and the soldiers returned a volley which roused the stockade to action. Many of the defenders had been asleep, and when they rose, they hastened to find whatever weapons were on hand, which for many were only makeshift pikes. Most of the California rangers had left the stockade in order to head off another troop movement. The twenty or thirty who remained, mostly sentries, flung themselves into foxholes inside the lower part of the stockade. There were one hundred and ninety besieged in total and there might have been many more had they not been surprised. The attackers consisted of two infantry groups, drawn from the 40th and the 12th, with the 40th mounted on the left and mounted police on the right, as well as another group of mounted police bringing up the rear. Following standard battlefield tactics, the cavalry flanked the stockade while the center advanced. The infantry fired off a few volleys, and the besieged returned sporadic fire. Then the troops charged the stockade on all sides with bayonets, breaking the defenses with ease. The soldiers were supposed to have been given orders to capture as many prisoners as possible, but Carboni recorded that they fired indiscriminately without offering surrender, 
on crossing the gully to return to my tent, an infernal trooper trotting on the road to Ballarat took a deliberate aim at me, and fired his mini-rifle pistol with such a tolerable precision that the shot whizzed and actually struck the brim of my cabbage-tree hat, and blew it off my head. Mrs. Davis, who outside the tent close by, is a living witness to the above. Wounded men and women, the wives and partners of the defenders, were bayoneted without the opportunity of surrender, and a woman and her child were burnt alive in a torched tent. The battle, if it can be called that, lasted no more than twenty minutes. The miners were surprised, possessed few weapons, were for the most part undisciplined, and fought without most of the rangers who might have put up a spirited defense. The exact number of digger casualties is uncertain, but they've been estimated between twenty-two and sixty. Lawler's left arm was shattered by a musket ball close to the shoulder, but he escaped capture by hiding beneath a pile of wooden slabs while in unimaginable agony, and was eventually secreted away after the soldiers left. Henry Ross, who took it upon himself to defend the Southern Cross, was mortally wounded, and lay at the flagpole while a trooper scaled it and removed the banner. He then left Ross, who was subsequently removed by comrades to the nearby Star Hotel. Ross died in terrible pain on the morning of December 5th. On the government side, six soldiers died and twelve were wounded, including Captain Henry Wise of the 40th Regiment, who died leading his men in the charge. Raffaello Carboni described the scene after the last shots had been fired. Dead and wounded had been fetched up in carts, waiting on the road. I hastened, and what a horrible sight! Old acquaintances crippled with shots, the gore protruding from the bayonet wounds, their clothes and flesh burning all the while. Poor Thonin had his mouth literally choked with bullets. My neighbor and mate, Teddy Moore, stretched on the ground, both his thighs shot, asked me for a drop of water. Peter Lawler, who had been concealed under a heap of slabs, was in the agony of death, a stream of blood from under the slabs heavily forcing its way downhill. It was not only men who perished in the massacre. A number of women reportedly ran onto the field to interpose themselves between the miners and the soldiers. One unnamed woman was butchered by a mounted trooper while pleading for the life of her husband. Father Smith joined the women in attempting to offer succor to the wounded, and also to administer the last rites, but he was forcibly removed by the soldiers. After the battle, Commissioner Reed issued a proclamation. Ballarat, December 3, 1854 Her Majesty's forces were this morning fired upon by a large body of evil-disposed persons of various nations, who had entrenched themselves in a stockade on Eureka and some officers and men were killed and wounded. Several of the rioters have paid the penalty of their crime, and a large number are in custody. All well-disposed persons are requested to return to their ordinary occupations and to abstain from assembling in ground, and every protection will be afforded to them. The Aftermath of the Eureka Rebellion The day after the battle, Lieutenant Governor Hotham declared a state of martial law for Ballarat and the surrounding area, starting at midday on December 6th. It lasted three days, and he praised the military for their conduct in attacking the insurgents instead of waiting until they were the aggressors, and their moderation and forbearance. Hotham felt that the gold fields could still erupt in revolution and did not stand the army down. He ordered that the license searches should cease, which would seem to confirm that they had been a deliberate provocation to insurrection, and he requested more troops from the governor of Tasmania. Ultimately, there were no further signs of unrest, demonstrating that the message had been received loud and clear. The lieutenant governor's reports were received with mixed reactions in London. The colonial secretary, Sir George Grey, 1799-1882, to publicly approved of his actions, but behind closed doors was scathing of Hotham's conduct. The lieutenant governor was an autocrat, governing the colony as if he were still a naval officer, and seldom taking the executive council into his confidence. Back in London, many government officials believed that both Hotham and Reed had seriously mismanaged the situation. John Leslie Fitzgerald Vesey Foster, 1818-1900, to was the Victorian colonial secretary, which meant he was the colonial office's man on the ground, and since he was the imperial representative, 
He unfairly bore much of the miners' opprobrium for the state of the goldfields, though despite having little influence with Hotham. In fact, he was acutely sympathetic to the plight of the miners, and advised the governor to abolish license fees and introduce a gold export tax, the same measure proposed by La Trobe and rejected by the legislative council. On December 4th, 1854, the day after the massacre, he offered his resignation to Hotham, who accepted it without regret. Immediately after declaring martial law, Hotham set about arresting individuals on charges of sedition and treason, which was defined as speech or action calculated to urge insurrection against Her Majesty's government. He chose foreigners in particular for prosecution, for he wished to deflect popular outrage against himself by presenting the rebellion as the product of foreign agitation. The first trial was that of Henry Seacamp, 1829-1864, the founder and editor of the Ballarat Times. The newspaper was launched on March 4, 1854, and was intended to be a voice for the disaffected miners. At first, Seacamp supported Hotham, believing that he was sympathetic to the miners. But in September 1854, Seacamp told readers that Hotham had secretly ordered Reed to renew the search for unlicensed miners. In an editorial dated October 14th, he castigated the police troopers and thereafter regularly wrote in support of the protesters. In one such editorial, he wrote, The die is cast, and fate has stamped upon the movement its indelible signature. No power on earth can now restrain the united might and headlong stride for freedom of the people of this country, and we are lost in amazement while contemplating the dazzling panorama of the Australian future. We salute the League and tender our hopes and prayers for its prosperity. The League has undertaken a mighty task fit only for a great people, that of changing the dynasty of the country. The League does not exactly propose nor adopt such a scheme, but we know what it means, the principles it would inculcate, and that eventually it will resolve itself into an Australian Congress. It is not for us to say how much we have been instrumental in rousing up the people to a sense of their own wrongs. We leave that to the public and the world. Seacamp was arrested on December 4th, as he was preparing a report on the assault of the previous day. He was tried and convicted in Melbourne on January 23, 1855, but he was imprisoned for just six months following a series of appeals. After his release, he continued to edit the Ballarat Times and later started a new paper in New South Wales in 1860. Eventually, 120 diggers were arrested, but only 13 faced trial. These included Raffaello Carboni, Timothy Hayes, chairman of the Ballarat Reform League, and John Manning, a reporter for the Ballarat Times who was in the stockade when it was charged. Seven were Irish, one was Scottish, two were European, two were of African descent, one was American, and one was Australian-born. Their trials for high treason by reason of levying war against the sovereign began on February 22nd. The chief prosecutor was Attorney General William Stahl, a Protestant Irishman who emigrated to Australia in 1842. Stahl's choice as prosecutor was questionable since he had been responsible for establishing the Ballarat police force and framing the regulations that governed the goldfields. He was, like Hotham and Reed, a staunch supporter of the licensing system and had no sympathy for the plight of the miners. The first case was heard by Sir William A. Beckett, Chief Justice of Victoria since 1852 and a former Solicitor General for New South Wales. He was a highly respected judge, known for his ability to apply British law to the peculiar conditions of the colonies. The defendant was John Joseph, an African-American man and U.S. citizen. The government anticipated that a black man would easily be convicted. All the other Americans arrested were freed at the request of the U.S. government. But even after Beckett instructed the jury to convict, the jurymen elected to acquit. The verdict was greeted with applause from the court prompting Beckett to condemn two members of the public of contempt and commit them to a week's imprisonment on the specious grounds that the jury might have acquitted in expectation of being applauded. Joseph was carried out in a chair in triumph and wildly cheered by a crowd of 10,000 who accompanied him in procession through the streets of Melbourne. The population of the city at the time was barely 100,000. After the acquittal of John Manning, the government decided to change judges. The remainder of the accused would be tried by Redmond Barry, a judge of the Supreme Court known for his severity and his belief that the colony of Victoria was the Wild West of the British Empire. 
and needed to be governed with the full vigor of the law. His sense of public duty could not be faulted, however, and there is no indication of bias in the trials of the Eureka defendants. The indictment made against each man was as follows. The charge is that you did on the 3rd December 1854, being then in a warlike manner, traitorously assembled together against Our Lady the Queen, and that you did, whilst so armed and assembled together, levy and make war against our said Lady the Queen, within part of her dominions called Victoria, and attempt by force of arms to destroy the government constituted there, and by law established, and to depose Our Lady the Queen from the kingly name and her imperial crown. It is highly debatable whether any of the participants in the events of December 3rd, 1854, intended to destroy the government and separate from the crown. On the contrary, the known actions and statements of Lawler and the other leaders indicate that they desired the abolition of the licenses and the conferral of voting rights. As to the charge of levying war, it is clear that the troops attacked the miners and not the other way round. It is true that the Ballarat Reform League had voted to secede if these demands were not met, but then no such declaration had been made at the meeting on Bakery Hill on November 29th. The oath which the miners actually swore, to stand truly by each other and fight to defend our rights and liberties, could hardly be said to be treasonous. Stahl tried to assert that swearing an oath by a flag other than the Union Jack signified treasonous intent but this nonsensical argument fell flat when it was pointed out that Stahl himself had protested against transportation under the banner of the Anti-Transportation League in 1851. Otham's commission to examine the administration of the goldfields issued an interim report on December 29, 1854, which reflected public opinion regarding the treatment of the miners. It had met only 22 days before and would continue deliberating until March 1855. The Commission looked into all the events and circumstances immediately preceding the fighting on December 3rd, including the burning of Bentley's Hotel. The fact that the Commission met at all must be credited to Hotham, though he cannot have been prepared for its findings. The author of the first report stated, I am unwilling to express an unfavorable opinion of the conduct of men who may yet have to answer for their conduct before the tribunals of their country. But amid the melancholy souvenirs of Ballarat, it is impossible to arrest one's thoughts among the details of the insurrectionary movement, and not to inquire as to its causes. These, so far as they related to the laws in force on the goldfield, and the mode of their administration, I have already referred to. The more immediate causes are to be found in the violent and exciting language employed by some of the popular agitators, and the foolhardy license-hunting expedition of Thursday. I believe that nearly all of these agitators were sincere in their determination to seek constitutional reforms by constitutional means only, and that they bitterly regret that recourse should have been had to arms. Some of them withdrew immediately on the determination to appeal to force, and exerted themselves at the peril of their lives to avert the threatened danger. Others, I believe, refrained from withdrawing from the movement, even after it had assumed its unexpectedly violent aspect from the hope that if they could not avert the insurrection, they might guide and modify it, and from a mistaken pride which forbade them to shun dangers they had themselves, in some degree, provoked. The Commission recommended a general amnesty for all those involved, effectively advising that all the defendants be acquitted. Hotham granted amnesty from prosecution for all soldiers and public officials, but refused to extend it to the miners. As such, the prosecutions continued. Thereafter, the trials descended into a farce. Knowing the advice of the government's own commission, prosecutors began marking time by visiting other courts to conduct business and returning to the treason trials to examine evidence they had not even heard. As acquittal followed acquittal, it became obvious what the final outcome would be in each case, and Peter Lawler was held in such esteem by the general populace that he avoided prosecution entirely. After his escape from the stockade, the government offered a reward of two hundred pounds for information leading to his arrest, yet the offer was taken up by no one. In the eyes of most of Victoria, Lawler was a hero of the people. When he finally emerged from hiding, the public raised enough money for him to purchase a sixty-five hectare property near Ballarat. When he appeared to purchase the property, the police, already cowed by the support for the thirteen accused, dared not arrest him. On the last day of the last trial, March 27, 1854, 
the Goldfields Commission published its final report, vindicating the cause of the miners. It recommended that the gold licenses be abolished and replaced by a miner's right, which would be issued for one pound a year. Revenue from mining would be collected from an export tax. The many gold commissioners in the gold fields would be replaced by mining wardens, and police numbers would be reduced. The commission recognized that many troopers were corrupt, and that Reed had carried out oppressive practices, including the onerous license searches. It also recommended that the vote be extended to all males with certain property qualifications, and that the miners who would qualify on account of holding a mining right be permitted to elect representatives to the Legislative Council. With that, all the protesters' grievances were answered, a grim reminder that the violent intervention was completely unnecessary in the first place. A less praiseworthy recommendation of the Commission was that the immigration of the Chinese, a pagan and inferior race, be restricted. Subsequent legislation decreed that only one Chinese individual per ten tons of ship may be granted entry to Victoria. Immigrants would overcome this by disembarking in South Australia, where no such restrictions existed, and walking twenty-five days to the goldfields. All the while, the violence against the Chinese community continued, prompting the government to issue further laws not to protect them, but to restrict their immigration, culminating in the infamous White Australia policy after 1901. For his part, Hotham had no choice but to implement the recommendations. He dismissed half the police force and transferred Reed to the post of Deputy Sheriff of Geelong, a town near Melbourne. He duly passed the Commission's recommendations to the Colonial Office, which agreed to the proposed reforms. The new Constitution of Victoria was passed by the Legislative Council, and after the consent of the British Parliament, it became law on November 23, 1855. The Legislative Council now became a house of review for bills considered by the new, popularly elected Legislative Assembly. Charles Hotham, now elevated to the rank of Governor, seemed reluctant to accept the new regime and appeared confused as to how responsible government should work. Instead of waiting for a general election and appointing a Premier, Prime Minister, who could command a majority in the Legislative Assembly, he selected a cabinet himself. William Haynes was appointed head of the government on November 28, 1855, but did not obtain a seat in the House of Assembly until the election of November 1856. Peter Lawler and John Humphrey were also elected to the Assembly at that time. Having granted a democratic government to Victoria, the British Colonial Office could hardly deny it to New South Wales, Tasmania, and South Australia, so in 1855 these colonies also became autonomous parliamentary democracies. Publicly, the Colonial Office had commended Hotham, but carefully avoided his term rebellion to describe the events on the goldfields. Behind closed doors, however, the Colonial Office questioned his treatment of the miners, and particularly of their leaders. Reports of the Commission and other colonial authorities made it clear that he could have avoided armed conflict, and indeed appeared to have provoked it. The new colonial secretary, Sir William Molesworth, was especially critical of the governor and rebuked him for ignoring the views and advice of members of the Legislative Council, as well as his own advice on transitioning from a gubernatorial to parliamentary government. Hotham did not receive such chiding well cloaked as it was in the gentlemanly language of the nineteenth century, and offered his resignation, along with a lengthy justification, in November 1855. Already in poor health, he died on December 31, 1855, of a fever at the age of forty-five. Hotham was replaced by a career politician, Sir Henry Barclay, 1815-1898, who had already been a successful governor of British Guiana and Jamaica. He arrived with the highest praises from the colonial office, and his governorship ensured the success of democratic government in Victoria. Charles Latrobe, who first grappled unsuccessfully with the Goldfields crisis, did not receive any further appointments from the government. He died on December 4, 1875, after losing his sight, still agonizing over decisions regarding the governance of the Goldfields. His first wife Sophie, writing to their daughter Agnes, told her, I suppose Papa tells you how much those gold discoveries have given him to do, how harassed and worried he feels at times. Your dear Papa is still as busy as ever he can be. His head gets but little rest even in the night, so much he has to think about official business, most of the time of an unpleasant kind, and I see so little of him that sometimes it makes me quite unhappy.' 
and every year I am hoping that if it is God's will, it will be the last of that kind of life in this country, and so far from all those who are dear to us. Despite his failings and inexperience, he was remembered fondly in Victoria, as evidenced by the number of roads, buildings, institutions of learning, parks, and libraries that bear his name, many of which were founded by him. Robert Reed survived the commission relatively unscathed, although it was clear that he had done much to keep the conflict between the government and the miners alive and bring it to a violent conclusion. He became Sheriff of Geelong in 1857 and later a colonel of the Victorian militia. He retired in 1889 and died of pneumonia in Melbourne on July 13, 1904, at the age of 89. Neither he nor any of his officers faced charges related to the December 3rd battle on account of the amnesty granted to them by Hotham. After being elected to the Legislative Council, Peter Lawler stood down to stand for the Legislative Assembly in 1856 and was returned as the member for North Grenville. As a parliamentarian, he advocated for minors and obtained compensation for the victims of Eureka. He was less successful in opposing a monument to Governor Hotham, remarking, There was sufficient monument already existing in the graves of the thirty individuals slain at Ballarat. But in the eyes of many miners, he adopted the views and manners of the Victorian landed gentry, disavowing democracy if democracy meant chartism, communism, or republicanism. Still, he professed to be a democrat if democracy means opposition to a tyrannical press, a tyrannical people, or a tyrannical government. Though the demands he and the Ballarat Reform League made of Hotham were essentially those of the Chartists. Nevertheless, his powerful advocacy for his constituents and his forthrightness, courage, and passion ensured he remained in Parliament until his death on February 9, 1889. In the course of his spectacular and unusual career, he had been made Speaker of the House of Assembly in 1880 and was nominated for a knighthood, which he declined. He was a fervent Roman Catholic and respected in a time when the cry of no popery was still strong throughout the British Empire. John Humphrey had not agreed with Lawler about armed resistance against the government, but he did stand with him in the Legislative Council, and was afterwards returned as an independent to the Legislative Assembly seat of North Grant. In time he joined the government serving as the Minister for Mines from 1860 to 1861, and chaired a royal commission on mining in 1863. In Parliament he possessed a powerful and eloquent voice, first used to advocate for Chartism, though like Lawler he was accused of moving away from its tenets. He died at the age of sixty-six on March 18, 1891, and was buried near the fallen of Eureka despite the fact he had chosen not to fight with them. Raffaello Carboni, the firebrand who stood with Lawler at Eureka, wrote the only eyewitness account of the Battle of Eureka, the Eureka Stockade, which was published in 1855. He briefly adjudicated mining disputes at the Ballarat local court before leaving Australia in 1856 to travel. Three years later he appeared in Italy, where he became involved in Giuseppe Garibaldi's Expedition of the Thousand. After helping with the unification of Italy, he died in Rome on October 24, 1875, at the age of 57. In the Ballarat Cemetery, a memorial was erected on March 22, 1856. It read, Sacred to the memory of those who fell on the memorable 3rd of December, 1854, in resisting the unconstitutional proceedings of the Victorian government. The government had the sense not to commemorate the fallen soldiers at the same time, but twenty years later an obelisk was erected in their memory. Interest in the events of November and December 1853 dwindled over the years, and Australian society displayed a reluctance to acknowledge the uprising's significance in the history of its democracy. When the centenary of the Eureka Rebellion arrived on December 3, 1954, it was commemorated by virtually nobody but a small group of communists. It was not until 1998 that an interpretive center was built near the site of the stockade, and even then, there was considerable public debate as to whether it was appropriate to commemorate what was widely believed to be an act of terrorism against a lawful government. When in 2004, the Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson was asked whether the Eureka stockade had any significance for Australia, he replied, I think people have tried to make too much of the Eureka stockade. I think that, you know, you're trying to give it a credibility and standing that it probably doesn't enjoy.
Needless to say, this attitude stands in marked contrast to Americans' views of the Revolutionary War and the French's views of the French Revolution. British society, upon which Australian society was modeled, historically has a great horror of rebellion against established authority, and particularly against the monarchy, and the British have been reluctant to take responsibility for acts considered subversive even if they achieved positive results. The Eureka flag is regarded by society at large not as a symbol of the just struggle for freedom, but as a banner of rebellion. It was hoisted by supporters of Prime Minister Gough Whitlam when he was controversially dismissed by Governor-General Sir John Kerr in 1975, and it has been flown by labor unions in their advocacy for workers. It has also been associated with republicanism, though secession from the British monarchy was not one of the Ballarat Reform League's avowed goals. This attitude is all the more curious, considering that Australians generally pride themselves on their national image with characteristics such as irreverence toward authority, egalitarianism, possessing a strong sense of justice and equity, a fair go, having empathy with the underdog against oppressive authority, and being a larrikin, someone who acts with disregard to convention. And yet the Eureka Rebellion, the only politically motivated uprising in Australian history, is for the most part regarded with curious indifference. In 1999, Premier of New South Wales Bob Carr called Eureka a protest without consequence, and in 1980, the historian Geoffrey Blaney dismissed its significance. Nowadays, it is common to see the flag and the Eureka Rebellion as symbols of Australian independence, of freedom from foreign domination, but many saw the rebellion in 1854 as an uprising by outsiders who were exploiting the country's resources and refusing to pay their fair share of taxes. So we make history do its handsprings. Even today, the Museum of Democracy, located in the nation's capital, tells visitors that historians debate the nature, objectives, and significance of the Eureka Rebellion. Historians tend to limit its role in the history of Australian politics to the extension of suffrage to all men. Mark Twain, writing in the United States, had a very different view. I think it may be called the finest thing in Australasian history. It was a revolution, small in size, but great politically. It was a strike for liberty, a struggle for principle, a stand against injustice and oppression. It is another instance of a victory won by a lost battle. It adds an honorable page to history. The people know it and are proud of it. They keep green the memory of the men who fell at the Eureka Stockade, and Peter Lawler has his monument. There is no doubt that the actual events of the Eureka Rebellion have been obscured by mythology and symbolism. The idea that it somehow marked the birth of Australia as a nation is belied by the fact that it was an uprising of people from all over the world in a relatively minor colony of the British Empire, and that these men had no intention of forming a new nation, as supported by the treason trials which found no evidence of the defendants repudiating the authority of the British Crown. On this point, it might also be remarked that leaders of the rebellion such as Lawler went on to establish conservative careers within the colonial establishment. The Eureka Rebellion is also often presented as the beginning of democratic government in Australia, which ignores the fact that the Australian Colonies Government Act 1850, legislated when the Port Phillip District separated from New South Wales, had already established autonomous government by a legislature which could enact any laws not in contradiction to those of the United Kingdom. It was true that the Legislative Council was only partially elected, but it possessed the power to create a second chamber which it did in 1855. In fact, the colonial office had always envisioned self-government for the Australia colonies, following the examples of Canada, self-government in 1848. Thus, democratic government would have developed in Victoria regardless of the rebellion. Over 150 years later, some have argued that men like Peter Lawler resisted the government in a way that made them part of the established order. The political commentator Eric Peterson pointed out that the miners wanted to become rich quickly. They were, after all, in search of gold, and simply wished to join the ranks of the elite. He also suggested that more potent examples of political and social activism occurred two years later, when the Stonemason Society in Sydney, New South Wales, became the first workers' association to successfully press for an eight-hour workday. Nevertheless, the Eureka Rebellion, 
regardless of how much it is appreciated, and regardless of its overall significance, continues to exert its powerful influence as a symbol of resistance against injustice and despotism. The white and blue flag still continues to unnerve the established order, and as recently as February 2018, the conservative government of Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull announced that construction workers would be forbidden from displaying the Eureka flag on work sites and even on their clothing. It seems safe to assume that the flag and the events associated with it will resonate well into the future. This has been The Eureka Rebellion The History and Legacy of the Gold Miners' Uprising Against the British in Australia Written by Charles River Editors Narrated by Gregory T. Lusitano Copyright 2020 by Charles River Editors Production copyright by Charles River Editors.